So uh, it is my honor and pleasure to uh, introduce our next speaker, uh, Dr. Talia Baker, who I think we stole from Northwestern recently, yes? Yes. Um, she is a hepatobiliary and liver transplant surgeon. Uh, she's expert, again, we're talking about living organ donation, particularly in liver transplant, uh, liver, living liver uh, transplantation. And I'm going to, there's a whole bio in your packet I'm going to address you to, but since we just got back on time, I'm going to step away and give her her time. <laughs> well, I'll be quick. Thank you so much for the opportunity to join this um, symposium. It's really exciting to talk about all of these issues about living donation, which is something that I feel very passionately about. But I think that coming away from living donation is just an opportunity for um, kidney donation. We have to think about all the different opportunities for organs to be transplanted as living donor organs. Can you hear me? So. Living organ donation, as Dr. Saunders mentioned, most commonly involves a single kidney, but can it also involve the, what I will be talking about most significantly, which is a segment of the liver. It can also involve a lobe of the lung and a portion of the pancreas or a portion of the intestine. So it's really important to understand that all of these issues around living organ donation revolve around the very many to different types of transplant or solid organ transplants that we do. Obviously, the only one that is not included here of solid organs is heart. And heart really kind of sets a precedent for what the ethical framework is around living donation. So heart is really the only organ that we can take from someone that they cannot survive, right? So it's something that we really have to understand as transplant physicians that although it seems like an ethereal question whether we would ever transplant a heart, it comes down to the fact that we as transplant physicians, as a community, as a medical community, and as a society, really have to be comfortable with the fact that living donation is always going to incur some type of risk for the donor. There's no way of getting around it. It's a medical procedure which always, by default, incurs a, a risk, and we have to, as a community, be comfortable with the risk. Obviously, with heart, we're not comfortable because it's 100% risk of mortality. There's no getting around that. So heart is something we've put aside, said even in situations where a child has a tragic heart condition, we would never let their mother give them their heart because we as a society do not think that's a reasonable thing to do. But as we look at the different types of organ donors that we can use, living donors that we can use, it's really important within each of these to establish the framework of what we are comfortable with. We as transplant physicians, we as a group of people who consider these things, we as a society, and certainly the recipients and donors as well. So keep that in mind as we kind of go through what I'm gonna talk about most significantly, which is my passion, which is living liver donation. So living donation in the United States, kidney transplants in the last year, 37% of the kidneys that were transplanted in the United States were living donors. That's a tremendous percentage. When you think about the fact in 2001, it was about 12% of the transplants that were ultimately done. Living liver donation, though, has really lagged behind that for many of the reasons that we're going to discuss as we go forward. But as of last year, it was only about 4.4% of all the living liver transplants that were done in the United States. In Asia, interestingly, where they don't have brain death um, declarations, they don't believe in the concept of brain death, 90% of the liver transplants that are done in Asia are done through living donor opportunities. Um, it's also under, important to understand, will that work? Yeah, they say you can roll with this. I got permission. Does that work? So living donor um, liver transplants are also performed in only 30% of liver transplant programs in the United States. This is for a lot of different reasons, but mostly because it's, very it's a very technically challenging procedure. It requires significant surgical expertise, but probably most importantly, it really requires institutional buy-in that this is a reasonable thing to do. So why do we do living donor liver transplants? Well, really it's because of this great crisis between the need for liver organs in the United States and the opportunities for deceased donation. You can see that in May of 2018, so most recently, there were over 14,000 people in the United States waiting for a liver transplant. Only 8,882 8, of those patients got transplanted the year before. So there's a huge gap. And unfortunately, the most tragic part of this gap is that there are a significant amount of people who die on the wait list, either because of disease progression or, um, in many cases, because their cancer has come outside the liver and makes them no longer a transplant candidate. 
So what are the advantages of living donor liver transplant over deceased organs? Living donor liver transplant is certainly an attractive practice, not only because it can be a significant source for expanding the pool of, living, of live donors, but also because it assures a recipient a healthy portion of liver with minimal preservation damage. So we can really control the situation. Um, it allows for the surgery to be done when the recipient has a better functional status. So again, a really important part of the donor and the recipient really working together to get the recipient at the optimal time, like we try to do with kidney donation. And it also frees a recipient from the uncertainty and vagaries of the wait list and its inherent hazards of complications and potential wait list mortality. This can't be spoken to enough. Being a liver, a liver transplant recipient on the wait list is something which is tragic for many of our patients, emotionally, physiologically, and psychologically. Kidney, kidneys have an alternative. They have dialysis. They have a way to replace their organ function through a machine. Dialysis is certainly not an excellent solution, but at least they have an alternative. For end-stage liver disease patients, there's no, nothing that can bridge them to the transplant. Um, but perhaps most importantly, when used as an intention to treat analysis, adult to adult living donor liver transplant is associated with a lower mortality than the alternative of waiting for a deceased donor liver transplant, even when it's performed for patients with a MELT score, which is how we designate the allocation system in the United States of less than 15. So even when you're very healthy, it's clear when you're very healthy, if you wait for a deceased donor organ, even if you are male, we call it male disadvantage. So your physiologic score does not reflect how much your liver disease is impacting your quality of life. Waiting for a deceased organ, and often because of the poor quality organ that you will get with a low allocation priority, you do better with a living donor. So this data really drove us to consider living donation. And further reductions in mortality occur after transplant centers gain experience with living donors and exceed a learning threshold of 20 procedures. So this is a really important point too. For kidney transplant, most kidney transplant centers in the United States perform living donation. As we talked about, very few of the centers in the United States perform living donors. And only those centers that do high volumes of living donors actually gain benefit from doing the procedure. So <clears throat> I think it's also really important, though, to think about what are the disadvantages of living donor liver transplant, and there certainly are many. Most importantly are the risks of the mortality and morbidity for the donors. There are short-term and long-term risks which span the period from the time of surgery through post-operative recovery, and as we are understanding as this becomes a more commonplace operation, there are implications which will affect them for the rest of their lives. The most severe and threatening complication, of course, is donor death. It is estimated at between two in a thousand and five in a thousand for left and right lobe donors respectively. Remember what Dr. Saunders said before, this is significantly higher than the mortality rate for a kidney donor. The other disadvantages of living donors should include the technical complexity of the surgery, the labor intensiveness of maintaining a living donor program, and the risk to the re reputations of the transplant surgeons the teams who support them, the institutions who support them, and the entire field if the donors are seriously injured or die. So this really brings us to what are the ethical conflicts in living donor liver transplant. I think very broadly this can be defined in the, by the fact that living organ donation overall, and especially in liver transplant where the mortality risk is real, it puts two very basic principles of medical ethics in conflict autonomy and non malthians Autonomy it certainly refers to the right of the patient to make their own decision about their health care without the doctor or other provider trying to influence their decision. non malthians is something that I think about all the time. It's what I took, the Hippocratic Oath, that obligates health care providers, the transplant surgeon, and anybody who's involved in the transplant event to avoid intentionally harming a patient. Living donation makes us consider doing that all the time. There's no way that we can get away from the fact that we as doctors, when we enter a living donor event, we completely defy our Hippocratic Oath. We are putting a donor at risk with no real benefit to the donor. There's no way you can argue that any donor gets any medical benefit from giving an organ, whether it's a kidney organ where the risk of mortality is very low, a liver organ where the risk of, of mortality is a little bit higher, or a heart um, donor where the risk of mortality is obviously 100%. In the case of living organ donation, 
these principles come into conflict, especially with respect to the donor, obviously, not so much with the recipient, although I would argue the recipient is as much in conflict. The donor is the one who makes a decision freely to donate, and as Dr. Saunders said, it's really the obligation of the transplant center and the living donor advocate to ensure that that decision is free of will and without coercion. But it does not in any way physically benefit the donor to have the, surg the surgery performed. This pretext therefore puts transplant physicians in the position of possibly willfully opposing the principle of non-malfiance. And it's something that every time I talk to a potential donor, I admit that this is something that I'm willingly entering into. So these pr ethical principles really work together to protect patients by positively assuring their freedom to make their own decisions, but also importantly by restricting the actions of healthcare providers to really ensure that they are thoughtfully, safely, safely and optimally delivering healthcare in a way that they know that they can. So back in 1989, just to give you some history, University of Chicago got ready to perform the first living donor, transplant, living donor liver transplant in the United States. Before they embarked on this procedure, just as they were starting to plan, they published this, this um, article in the New England Journal where they laid out the ethical issues that they had felt would be addressed while, when, they, when they went on to do a living donor. So about a month later, they performed the first living donor liver transplant in the United States. It was from a mom to her, her daughter, Alyssa, who now just, we actually just watched her get married. She's 25 years after her transplant. She's now longer than that. She's doing great. She's still alive today. She's doing wonderfully. And it was a really exciting um, event that happened here at United, the University of Chicago. It set in motion a huge movement in the United States where living donation, both from adult to children and from adult to adults, became almost commonplace. But, in 2002, a tragic event ha happened at one of the biggest centers that was doing living, donate, living liver donation in the United States at Mount Sinai, where a brother who gave um, his brother a liver died in the early post-operative period. It's still, to this day, unclear exactly what prompted the death. It was a post-operative death that happened on post-operative day number six. It likely had to do with um, some physiologic events that were happening in their um, intestinal tract, but we don't know. But certainly, this was a tragic event that really brought the whole transplant community and certainly the living donor community to a halt and made us think about what are these ethical issues that we're, um, we're facing. I think it's interesting that in this article, which was the first New York Times article to talk about this, our new chief, who is also just recruited to University of Chicago, Dr. John Fung, who is then the chief of transplantation at the University of Pittsburgh, says that even for a normal healthy person, a mortality rate of 1% is hard to justify. So we acknowledge that any mortality rate is something that ethically we as transplant physicians have to think long and hard about before we reinitiate a living donor transplant program. So Mount Sinai was put on hold for almost three years. There were living donor guidelines, which now pretty much dictate most of what we do in living donation, um, which were developed in New York State and how have become commonplace around the United States. But what was most importantly recognized by that event was that a donor death can be devastating in magnitude, not only for the donor and the recipient families, but also importantly for the transplant team, the transplant program, and the transplant community as a whole. So in response to this, the living donor liver transplant community came together and through the NIH was able to form a consortium of nine centers which developed into 16 centers actually, which looked at outcomes for living donor livers to try to gain the data which would hopefully allow us to drive our decision making both medically and ethically towards whether living, donate, living liver donation was a reasonable thing to, per, to um, pursue. So A2ALL was a very important um, consortium. It went from 2002, it most recently ended in 2016, and produced a tremendous amount of data, not only on outcomes for donors and recipients, but probably most importantly on quality of life issues for both donors and recipients after living donor liver transplant. So it really brought to a fore our ability to understand from a data-driven perspective what the ethical principles in living donation were which would guide how we would go forward with living donors. 
So the practice of living organ donation continued and continues today to generate debate within and outside the transplant communities with occasional anguish for both donors and recipients and transplant surgeons pointing to the importance of the situational and contextual factors which apply ethical principle and really force us to balance donor safety, recipient outcomes, and obviously the need for transplantation. Um, there are, Charlie Miller, who was unfortunately involved in the living donor death at Mount Sinai, he was the chief of transplantation there, really has devoted his career since that day to understanding these ethical issues. And he, for, he talks about these four foundational principles which drive what he does as a living donor surgeon. He talks about respect for persons including their autonomy in support of informed and voluntary consent. The duty of the healthcare professionals to benefit the patients, so benefit, beneficence, and to avoid needlessly harming and putting them at risk. I also argue with Dr. Miller that the fair distribution of the scarce resource of solid organs, distributive justice, which is generally referred in the deceased donor community, is really important, especially in living donor liver transplant, because every time we embark on a living donor event, we make an, a deceased donor organ available for another recipient. So we're actually opening up opportunities for transplant, not only for that recipient who has a living donor, but also for another recipient who isn't as lucky to have a living donor. So to adequately justify living organ donation, especially in the liver, the four central ethical principles need to be further operationalized through assessing and optimizing donor safety, evaluating expected recipient outcomes, and considering individual and societal needs, as in the case of distributing organs. I think this, these are really important, and I would argue that almost every single liver, living donor liver transplant program in the United States really lives and dies by these ethical principles and creates their programs around them. So he also developed this idea of the tripartite ethical equipose. It's a really a framework for how we balance donor safety, expected recipient outcomes, and the need for transplantation. Only when the area of the triangles is proportionate to the degree of ethical good can we really go forward with a living donor event. So this framework of ethical equipose leads us to the conclusion that there are thankfully, situational and contextual factors that when present and when well-defined in specific transplant cases, ethically supports adult to adult living donor liver transplantation. And these led to international guidelines which were, really, which were recently published, which allow us to really understand how we should put together programs, how we should decide on donor and recipient matching, and how we should go forward with the living donor procedure. So some examples that they gave. If in a case survival expectations are too low for the recipient, for example, if you have a patient with liver cancer, which is what we call outside criteria, or so advanced that there's very little likelihood that they will derive benefit from a <coughs> transplant, whether a deceased donor or a living donor, there, there should be no amount of need and that in those situations, that should be used as a rationale to expose a donor to risk. So if the recipient isn't going to do well, it is, not, it is not allowed for a transplant physician to offer transplantation through living donation. Another example is left flow of donation. So we talk about transferring the risk from the donor to the recipient. So it's clear that left lobe donation is significantly safer for the donor. So that's only taking about 30% of the liver rather than 60% of the liver. Clearly there's some risk that's transferred to the recipient, but we feel that if using a donated left lobe can be equally efficacious in assuring a good recipient outcome, and these are technical issues that we have learned to overcome over time, Triangular equipose would argue that left lobe living donation should be preferred over right lobe living donation. And again, it's something that the living donor transplant community is considering and really moving towards as we develop in our surgical expertise. So I also wanted to end with just a few thoughts about how all of these things are really coming into our world in 2018. So we understand how important it is for these ethical principles to really guide how we develop 
offer and engage patients in living donor liver transplant. But as transplant physicians, we always must remember that we have to strive for donor safety with an ultimate dream of zero donor morbidity and mortality, although we know we can't get there, we have to get as close to there as we possibly can. And within the context of the ethical dilemma of live liver donation, can we now even right reasonably venture into new territories and expand consideration of potential living live donors? Um, I think it's really interesting, and kid kidney donation is way ahead of liver donation at this point. There's much more use of social media, for example. There's more use of donor champions, finding different ways to go out and make the ask for a donor from the recipients. Certainly social media has really changed the field of living donor liver um, kidney transplantation because it's allowed people to really broaden their, their catchment area to find a donor. Is this right to do in liver donation with the added mor morbidity or mortality? It's something that we really have to consider before we aggressively pursue it. And I think although altruistic donation has become not commonplace but accepted in kidney donation, um, we at University of Chicago do use altruistic or anonymous donors, and especially in initiating what um, Dr. Saunders showed you, those chains, so that more people than one pair can be considered for um, the opportunity for transplantation. In liver, living donor liver transplant, where it's a more dangerous operation, it's more technically challenging, is it even ethical to consider altruistic donation in this, um, in this field? And is refusing people the opportunity to donate paternalism on our part? And I leave that for you and would love to entertain any questions that you may have. Thank you. So we have a bit more time now for questions. Thank you so much. Um, in your in the last slide, in the third question, you talked about social media and 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 there was a question that had occurred to me earlier in the presentation, so I guess it, it relates to that. Uh, with regard to how do you assess coercion? Uh, what, what are really the limits? When does coercion compromise autonomy, and when might it be a fuzzy area in terms of why a person may donate? So it's an Excellent question, very easy for me to answer because I can defer to someone like my living donor advocate because part of what we do as living donor physicians is we really try to remove ourselves as much as we can um, from the assessment of the donor and the assessment of the donor situation as they come forward and whether they are coming forward of their own will, whether there's coercion involved, whether in the transplant community a big absolute no is whether there's monetary um, movement in the event of an organ donor. And so we had part of the New York State guidelines were a determination that a living donor advocate who was a physician or a physician um, delegate who was not involved with either the donor or the recipient at the outset would independently act as the advocate for the donor but also be the person who would assess whether there is coercion, whether there are monetary monies being transferred, whether there is some reason that the patient is coming forward not of their own free will. So when we sit together to make decisions about living donation, we really stick by the principle that we have to do this as a team and everybody's input is as important. But in living donation, the living donor advocate is really the head of the team, more so than the surgeons, the physicians, the nephrologists, anybody who's involved. The living donor advocate really has the last word because they can assess those exact issues. Oh, so, so I'll just say, um, so we think about that a lot. Um, and one of the things that we do is, you know, we sort of look at the family dynamic who called who calls for the person who comes to the visit and so we welcome all families for part of the visit before any surgical consent or discussion of this risk we actually at least for some part of the visit talk to that person alone without anyone in the room and we ask some of the same questions to get a sense of what their thoughts are and what they perceive as the risk and the benefits. And then we also ask the most important question, if you chose not to go forward with this, what do you think would happen? And if you think that the answer is, you know, my 
you know, something that's really a real big sort of family or community issue, then we want to raise that concern. If it's beyond us, then we actually send them to um, our psychiatrist to sort of assess things also. And we've also had things where we've actually convened the whole, a whole ethics case conference to have a bunch of ethicists from a variety of viewpoints to sort of weigh in on it. So it's not just my bias or one, one other person's bias. We're really sort of bringing in both um, our medical perspective but a broader community perspective in what is free will. And so we do reassess and we also say with both the family and with the person not in the room, you can say no up until the point that we put you to sleep and you're no longer able to talk and, and you know we won't try to talk you out of it. My goal um, is not to have a surgery go forward. I think living donation is a great thing, but my goal is to help the person who comes to me to make a decision that works best for them. And sometimes that answer is no. And, and that's the best decision both for them and for their family and really for our transplant community because it oh. takes you know, one donor death, the one person who says someone paid me or I felt like I couldn't say no, and it really influences donation for the larger community. Mm -hmm. Of course. So in, in the case, I mean, evidently a lot of decisions that are made by individuals are influenced by their family, community, mm -hmm. culture, cult, or, you know, a variety of different, way, you know, uh, sources that uh, you know, are, 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 in, are in their environment. So in those cases where you ask the question and get a response, uh, ask the question about consequences of not going through with it, um, uh, at, at those times where a person does reference family, culture, community, or is that an immediate red flag, or how do you navigate that? No. So one like of the things, to, just to answer that really quickly, and then Mel, I'll defer to you. Um, one of the interesting parts of living donation that we have developed over the past, mostly from the, the donor death that happened at Mount Sinai, is the idea of a medical excuse. So if you come forward and our living donor advocate or our physicians or anybody who interacts with the patient, and again, we really do tell them, we actually don't go ahead with a living donor event on the day of surgery. We individually see the patient before anesthesia season so they can't get any, and we ask them again, do you want to go forward? So we really give them the opportunity to the point that they get their first medication when they can no longer make a reasonable decision. But we offer them the opportunity to not only say no, but if they feel uncomfortable for any reason that there will be consequences in their family, and again, you can argue the ethics of this, there's something called a medical excuse where we as the physicians will be asked by either the living donor advocate or the patient themselves to tell the recipient that we have a medical reason that the patient cannot come forward. We don't delineate what that medical reason is. We don't share that with the insurance companies that we've said that there's a medical reason. But with the family and the community overall, we tell them there's a medical reason that we feel that we cannot go forward. So the responsibility is taken off the donor, and they can go on with their lives without consequence. But, but I want to maybe address this issue. And, and I agree with you 100%. If we feel like it's people can't say no, then we give them a way to say no. But I also think that we don't, we, we try, we are all human, try not to be biased against different decision-making pathways for different communities. And so we know that for some, many communities, it is a family and it is a community decision. And that's why we want to share all of the information and answer questions and get the feedback from all of the members within a community. And, and we value that, and we know that people make decisions not just based on what they think, but also what their family and what their community members think and what they value. And so we certainly welcome that, and we don't think of that as coercive. We think of that as that's how we all operate in the world. But ultimately, um, we want to have a short conversation with the one person who is the patient um, to make sure that we affirm that even with all of those decision makers, that one person has ultimately made the decision or agrees with that decision. So. Thank you. A couple of um, kind of technical questions. 
um, is there any reason, what would be a reason to do a right lobe um, transplant as opposed to left lobe? And then if you could address what life looks like for both the donor and the recipient after donation, um, you know, how long till recovery, do they get a full recovery? And would a recipient, like, um, would they remain ill if they just received, you know, 40% of a liver, or do they go on to full recovery? They go on to, so, um, why would you do a right lobe, a left lobe rather than a right lobe? Well, ideally, from an ethical standpoint and from the ethical framework standpoint, you would always do a left lobe. Left lobes are significantly technically more difficult, and they can result in something called small for size. So it has everything about liver. Kidneys have to do with matching. Livers have to do with size. Livers is much more plumbing. But the liver regenerates. So even with a small graft, the liver will regenerate, and it very aggressively regenerates. So programs who have really developed significant expertise are able to um, go to very small graphs. And University of Nebraska, which is the biggest proponent of as low as you can go to really transfer the risk from the donor to the recipient, they actually do transplants in selected individuals with only a piece of the liver that we would normally give to the baby, which is called the left lateral segment. It's just two segments of the liver, which is about 15% of total liver volume. And he's able to do that su successfully. He is so technically adept at this, nobody's been able to reduce, uh, replicate those results. But certainly, ideally we would all do left lobe donors, but not every program has the expertise to do that. That being said, those centers which are experts in doing living donation really have excellent outcomes for the donors even when 60 to 70 percent of the lobar volume is taken out. There have been really excellent regenerative studies which have shown that liver regeneration actually starts in the operating room. Immediately, you can see it. By three weeks, you have about 70 percent of your total liver volume back. And by three months, you have 90 to 95%. You never get to 100%, but you have enough liver volume. You only need about 10% of your liver volume to function totally normally, to not even notice that you've had a liver resection. So if you can imagine, we start with a 300% um, way to have a, a backup plan. And then by three months, we're at almost 90% of full liver function. So living donors do very well, even right lobe donors. Right lobe donors, um, from my experience at Northwestern, they generally have a two to three day hospital length of stay. By about a week after surgery, they start feeling pretty much back to themselves. By a month out, they're off all pain medications. Most of them are back at work. The only real limitation that they have is they can't do any heavy lifting or heavy activity because they don't want, you don't want to get a hernia in your incision. And by six weeks, they're generally back. We had a extreme skateboarder who don donated to her father. And within three months of transplants, she was back on the X Games. So people do exceptionally well. We don't usually encourage people to get back to that kind of vigorous activity that quickly, but they can. And we actually encourage people, I have people out of bed walking around the unit on the night of the surgery. So people do exceptionally well. They're obviously a very select group of very healthy people who we have defined will tolerate the resection that we do because we do very careful volumetric analyses of the livers prior to doing the procedure. There's a tremendous amount of planning that goes into a right lobe living donor event and it really allows us to have a great margin of safety. Um, the recipients who get living donors do exceptionally well as well. Their hospital length of stay is generally three to five days. By about a month out, they're feeling pretty much back to normal. By three months, they're back to normal activity. Doing a liver transplant for us as, living, as liver surgeons is to get people back to their normal life. We never want to think about, like, people have this discussion where they feel like they're in the transplant bubble after the operation. We do liver transplants so people can be given back their healthy existence, and that's the ideal. And living donor liver transplant is really a way to do that. That being said, if you're a deceased donor, if you're a deceased donor recipient, and you receive a good deceased donor, and you're relatively healthy going into the transplant, you'll do just as well. It's just that we don't have enough grafts to give to every. If we had enough grafts to give to everybody with deceased don for a deceased donor, nobody would even consider doing living donation, right? Because it would never be ethically right to put the donor at risk if we had other opportunities for grafts. But we don't, unfortunately. So we're all trying desperately to figure out ways to best service our recipient population. mentioned in, in Asia, 90% of the uh, donors are living donors. 
What is the cultural background of that? Why don't they use the deceased owner? So you could probably speak to it more. Let's, I, so there is a lack of recognition of the definition of brain death. So they don't believe in deceased donation because they don't, you have to be brain dead, declared brain dead to become a deceased donor. So there's a feeling that there is no such thing for cultural reasons, for religious reasons, et cetera, spanning across um, the Middle East and Asia that say that deceased, that brain death is not a reasonable expectation. So in China, China is different um, in, some, in some regions of China. And there is a movement in China where they are actually not amongst their general population, but amongst their prison population. There's a movement where donors are being considered who are prisoners, who are um, executed with heparinization as donors. It's a real scourge for the transplant community. It's something that we all as transplant physicians have um, been working with and trying to understand for a very long time. But um, as a transplant physician in the United States, I feel very strongly against that practice. But. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I just wanted to ask what risk is a risk worth taking because I think looking at your um, ethical equipose it's actually a symmetrical triangle in other words we're saying that the value of autonomy um, or the value of donor safety sorry is, is equivalent or equal to the value of um, the outcome the benefit that we'll get um, normally we can't choose that option that causes us harm um, so I'm just wondering what harm what risk um, is a risk worth taking. And going back to Dr. Saunders' presentation, she framed um, the long-term outcomes five of end-stage renal failure as 5 to 10% increased risk. Um, but then you followed that up by saying that it's not, the absolute numbers are actually right. not that great. But you can frame it and say it's a 500% to 1,000% times risk right. of developing end-stage renal failure as a result. So I'm just interested in in how you come to the conclusion of what risk, what risk is, is worth taking. I think if you could answer that question, you would move the living donor transplant community forward tremendously. None of us know that answer. And I think each of us as transplant physicians, as living donor advocates, as anybody within an institution who believes in living donation, you really have to, for your own personal um, insight, know what risk are you willing to take. Certainly, my, the risk I would be willing to take should be zero risk, right? But I know that I'm never going to get there. So I know as a, trans, as a living donor surgeon, I know my responsibility to the donor is that everything that I do has to be geared towards the donor's safety. And that includes when you think about right lobe versus left lobe donor. If I know that the... Um, that the, right, the recipient is not going to do well, as well with a left lobe versus a right lobe, but I know the donor is going to do better with the left lobe versus the right lobe, I'm going to do the left lobe. I'm going to always do that. And just to give you a clinical anecdote, when we're in the operating room, we always have a living donor advocate surgeon. We always do these, it's a very technically complicated surgery, so we always do this with two surgeons, two advanced, well-trained, surgeons who have worked together for a long time in more than 20 cases. Um, we always have one of those surgeons who is a living donor advocate and will usually not cross over except to help on the recipient side. So when you're the living donor advocate surgeon, there are small things like where the bile duct, the bile duct is the tube that drains the liver to, um, to allow bile to fall into the intestines. So one of the critical is technical issues in living donor liver transplant is where you cut the bile duct. So we will literally have 10 to 15 minute discussions between myself, the living donor advocate surgeon, and the recipient surgeon about where to cut the bile duct to make it not a difficult surgery for the recipient. I always win. 
because the most important thing that I have to do when I'm cutting across the bile duct is make sure that there will be no long-term complications for the donor. Even if that means they're gonna get three bile ducts on the recipient and it's gonna be an incredibly technically challenging problem that may have long-term consequences to the recipient, I get to make that decision. So it doesn't really answer your question of what risk are you willing to take. We'd like to say zero risk, but we know as physicians we can never promise that. There's nothing that I can do as a surgeon which can promise you 100% perfect outcome. Even if I do a hernia on you, I can't promise you that everything's gonna go perfectly because I just don't have that kind of control. Okay, I wanna thank Dr. Baker and also Dr. Okay. Sanders for this um, presentation. We have to move on now, I'm sorry. Um, thank you.